morning, church. Um, I'll be reading from Titus chapter 1, verse 5 to 9. The reason I left you in Crete was to set right what was left undone, and as I directed you to appoint elders in every town. An elder must be blameless, the husband of one wife, with faithful children who are not accused of wildness or rebellion. As an overseer of God's household, he must be blameless, not arrogant, not hot-tempered, not an excessive drinker, not a bully, not greedy for money, but hospitable, loving what is good, sensible, righteous, holy, self-controlled, holding to the faithful message as taught, so that he will be able both to encourage with sound teaching and to refute those who contradict it. This is the word of the Lord. We are currently in a series called Transforming Culture. We're working through Paul's letter to Titus, and we are asking two key questions as we go. How can Christians wisely participate in culture in order to transform it for the common good? It's a crucial question. Two, how can our lives make the teaching about God our Savior, we call that the gospel, attractive? Important questions. The church should be an agent of transformation. Not through culture wars or assimilation to culture, but through wise participation in culture. Right? So it's not like we are going to fight with culture the whole time, and it's not like we're just going to follow culture the whole time. We are going to wisely participate in culture as Christians, and through that be an agent of transformation. Let me give you some truth in the beginning of my sermon. Your devotion to Jesus and the common good of the area which we inhabit will show the beauty of the message about our saving God. So your commitment to Jesus and your commitment to showing the life of Jesus will bring transformation and will show the beauty of the gospel to people through our lives. Last week, Lesego started our series and he covered the overview and the purpose of the book Titus. He also spoke about the richness of the content to be found in only the first four verses of chapter 1, and at the end of his sermon, he said that just looking at those first four verses, we should have confidence as Christians, we should have hope, we should be changed, right, transformed by the gospel, and we should look forward to eternal life with God the Father himself. Think of Lesecho's sermon as the first episode of a series, right? It tees up the story. And uh, as we'll be in Titus for another five weeks, which includes today, we'll continuously circle back to those themes as well. Our theme for today, easy question, who, well, simple question, but not an easy one. Who can lead the church? Who can lead the church? seems like good leaders are hard to find. It seems like leaders and leadership at the moment are in a really tough space. Often what happens is our societal problems are laid at the door of who? Of our leaders. Mostly, it's rightly so, it's not always, but mostly. Quick Google the word of the year for South Africa 2022. Here's your short list. Five options, pala pala, load shedding, xenophobia, inganekwana, gaslighting. Now, I'm going to gently and intentionally sidestep number four, because in Zulu culture, that word means a lot more than only the direct translation one would find to English, okay? The SA word of the year is a word, a term, or expression preferred to reflect the passing year in language. So that's our short list, and in the end, it was the word load shedding that actually won. So the year for 2022 in South Africa is the word load shedding. Now here's the thing, if you Google these topics and you read about them, you'll see the word leaders, 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 leadership, 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 executives, ministers, committees, departments, etc. All of these problems, which is our societal problems, are laid at the door of leaders. You find the word abuse 
in articles about those topics. You find the words abuse of power, which features in many stories in our society, and it also features in the lives of the people sitting here. Many of you have experienced someone abusing their power and hurting people and causing pain. Think about all the different spaces in which you live, all the way from home to family to work to your third places to society at large. How many examples could you actually give of a good leader? I'm glad that you could give one, but what if I stretch to a bit? What if I said 19 leaders that are worth following, or 10 people that you would deem to be good leaders? I would like to put it to you that you'll probably take a long time to find those names. Now, unfortunately, the church is not exempted from this. Leaders make mistakes. Leaders abuse their power and their authority. They cause hurt and pain in the lives of people in the church. So what should we do? And if I say what should we do, I'm talking about a micro level. I'm talking here. I'm talking fellowship city. I'm not talking anything more than that. I'm talking our church. What should we do? It's an important question for us because this is an exercise of discernment, right? On the one hand, it's about holding your current elders and this church's leadership accountable. And on the other hand, asking this question will help you to discern who you should follow and who you should not follow. Because Lasekho and I, as the elders of this church, are not the only people who influence you. There are many more people that influence you on a daily basis. And not all of them are worthy of following. So you need to have a lens through which you can view leadership as a Christian so that you can know who to follow. So what should we do? I've got a great answer as a teaching pastor. Let's study the scriptures together and then find out. Let me pray for us. Lord Jesus, I pray that you illuminate our minds now, that you would give us a compelling picture of leadership in your church, that we would see you as the perfect leader and the one who's worthy of following. I pray that we would see and find ways that we can transform culture through this view of leadership. And I pray that you would have me now speak the words that you would want me to speak and that you would have us know what you would want us to know and do according to your word. I pray, Lord Jesus, that this is a time of, of inspiration for us and of growth for us. Holy Spirit, have your way in us as we walk through your living word that pierces even to the deepest part of our being. We pray that in your name. Amen. I'm a three-point guy, so three points today. Here we go. Why should Titus appoint elders? Who qualifies as elders? And who and what are elders overseeing? Only four verses, but these four verses will unpack all of these. So there's your three points for today. If you are a photo person, it's time to take the photo now, but I'll walk us through it. Okay, firstly, why should Titus appoint elders? The job of Titus was twofold, and I'm going to use the drawing of the Bible project to just help us see this. So if you look at uh, the heading up top, 5 to 16 in chapter 1 is about the tasks of Titus, and you'll see that the tasks are twofold. On the one hand, he has to complete the organization of the church in Crete, that is appointing new leaders. And on the other hand, he has to preserve the church from the contamination of false teaching. Okay? So he has to sort out the corrupt leaders in the church at that moment. And the first one, appointing good, new, solid leaders, is the first step to sorting out their contamination in terms of false teaching. Do you guys see that? Also interesting to note in this portion of Scripture, Paul doesn't write to Titus and say, get all the bad ones out. He said, appoint new ones, ones who are worthy of following, ones who can actually handle the crises that comes with leading the church, and then you sort out the bad ones, right? Not chasing them away, but refuting them and confronting them and helping them to view the gospel and the teaching of the apostles in the right way again. Now, Lysichel said this last week, but just in case you missed it, this is Titus's job 
because Paul and Titus had a missionary tour through Crete, an island off the coast of Greece, and this was after Paul's first release from prison. And Paul left Titus before he was able to finish this job in Crete. And that's why he's writing it to him now. So Titus stayed to finish the task. It's a simple highlight in verse 5 that I just want to show to you. That's the focus of his job there. Set right what was left undone and appoint elders in every town. Now, in Crete, the problems were those of a new church. Okay, so amongst other things, we also have those problems because we're only one year old. There were no administrative, uh, there was no administrative structure in the church, meaning no one really knew what was going on, right? We were a church and we knew that there were people preaching and people doing stuff, but it was a lot more chaotic and a lot less organized. They also faced pressure from outside Jewish groups telling them that they're doing it wrong or interpreting it wrong. It's commonplace of a new church. And then obviously there was evidence of sinful behavior among the people. Because it's people who just got to faith, they just submitted their lives to the Lordship of Jesus Christ, and they are all creatures of habit. So they're learning how to live in this new way, but while they're learning how to live in this new way, they are really sinful. They are new Christians acting according to the culture, according to what they know. And culture, as you guys know full well, is a very strong force in society. Imitation is part of the nature of creation, not only in humanity. Like, that's what we do. We look, and then we copy. It happens the same with a little zebra that was just born. It happens the same with kids as they grow up. The old saying goes, as they see, so they do. It's part of creation. And as we imitate, we learn culture, because we grow up in culture. So it's a very, very strong force. So submitting your life to Jesus Christ doesn't mean that everything of your past life is all done. It's dealt with, but it's not done yet. There's a process of transformation that needs to happen. Let me, let me give you an illustration. This is a cereal bowl. Guess who got it all this morning? It's quite easy to get there. Take out the bowl. Take out the cereal. Pour cereal into the bowl. Pour milk over cereal. Decide whether you want a chow with cold or hot. Eat. It's really not that difficult. Well, for me, as a 37-year-old male who's done it a gazillion times. I have a seven-year-old daughter. Her name is Ava. You guys might have seen her in, front of the church, or in the front of the church building earlier. If Ava chows cereal, this is where we end up. Next slide, please. It's, it's, it's not that difficult, but we end up there. Now, Ava is a really good metaphor for a new church, right? Why? Because Ava doesn't know the process and the sequence, the administrative structure, if you want, of how to get cereal done, right? I do it without even thinking about it. She doesn't know where the bowls and the spoons are. She doesn't know where the cereal is. She doesn't know uh, in which shelf on, uh, in the fridge the milk is. Right? She doesn't know how to pour a full box or how to pour a less empty box. She doesn't know how to open the cereal bag necessarily. There's so many things that she doesn't know, but I do. And it's because I'm older than her and she's new. Right? Ava also feels pressure from other groups, like her friends at school asking her, do you do your own cereal in the morning? Because I do, and I'm cool like that. And then Ava feels the pressure, and she asks me, Dad, can I please also do my cereal myself? Right? So she feels this pressure. And there's also outright sinful behavior from my seven-year-old daughter not listening to me. Right? It's just how it is. So she knows that she has to follow my example, but she thinks that she knows better. That's a kid, guys. It's a new human. Exactly the same issues as with a new church. Now, there's nothing wrong with Ava. She's just young. It's how it is. Now, as her father, 37 years old, I'm there to show her the way. I have done this longer than she has done it. I know the drill. I can show her. If she follows my lead, and I lead her well, these kind of spills will be something of the past. 
And I have to tell you, as dad at this moment, whoo, I cannot wait for that day. It's a simple illustration, but it drives home the truth that this is exactly why the church needs elders. And why Paul felt that the organization of the church wasn't complete. Get this line. Someone needs to show the way. And that's why the church needs elders. In exactly the same way that Ava needs someone to show her the way, Christians and young Christians and young churches and young believers need someone to show them the way. It's a radical thought in our current world. But let me tell you, we will be transforming culture if we as believers humbly say that we don't know everything there is to know about what it means to live a life of faith. If we as believers say, I willingly submit myself under the leadership of Jesus Christ and the leaders that He's given to me at my church so that they can show me the way, we will transform culture. Because culture says you know everything you need to know. Culture says don't listen to anyone. You be you and I'll be me. Culture says you don't have to submit under anyone. No one can lord over you. The Bible says that the church needs leaders so that Christians can be shown the way. And one of the ways that we will be transforming the culture that we live in is by exercising this humility and exercising this submission and testifying about it and talking about it. The way that we can wisely participate in culture on this point is to be a counter-narrative of let me be me. Can you imagine at the water cooler at work or on the team's meeting, when you check in with your team, or wherever you engage with people. If you say to people, this is what I'm currently learning, or I was really humbled by this, or someone helped me to understand this thing, and now I have learned this skill. We should be different than the leave me alone and just let me be me kind of culture we have. Because that's unfortunately the world we live in is the moment I reveal something in your life or I say something you, to you that you don't like, you just cancel me because I know better as an individual. And I would like to submit it to you that none of us know better. We need each other because we are a church and a family. I spent way too much time on this point, but I think that I drove it home. So why did Titus have to appoint elders? Because someone has to show the way. Let's spend a lot of time at the second point. Who qualifies as elders? So if you just uh, uh, look at the slide, there's a lot of highlights there. Okay, so the bulk of the sermon sits here. And the bulk of this portion of scripture answers this question. Who qualifies as elders? Now, Titus is instructed first, check this, to look at a man's home life. Since his management of this responsibility will reveal his ability or his lack of ability to be a steward in God's house. Did you see that? So the personal life of a leader is the first place you start. And then he throws in this ripper of a word. The person should be blameless or above reproach. That is a hard ask. Let me show you a quote from a church father. This is now from the 4th and the beginning of the 5th century. His name was Ioannes Chrysostomos. That's the correct Greek pronunciation. In very, very uh, eloquent English, it's John Chrysostom. In my Afrikaans way of saying English names, it's Chrysostomos. Check this. He says about church leadership, church eldership, we should observe what, he, what care he bestows upon children. For he who cannot be the instructor of his own children, how should he be the teacher of others? If he cannot keep in order those whom he has had with him from the beginning, whom he has brought up and over whom he had power by both laws and by nature, how will he be able to benefit those without? Phooey! That's a tough one, but it's important. So home management first, and then church. Then Paul spells out five vices and seven virtues. And he throws in the word blameless in there as well, right? No disclaimer there of maybe every now and then. He goes, a leader should not do this, and he should do this. 
without blame. Okay? So I made a little list for you because I think it just reads a little bit easier than keeping all the highlights on there. But there you go. So the vices in this portion of Scripture is the nots in this translation. And the virtues comes after the but in our portion of Scripture. Not arrogant, not hot-tempered, not an excessive drinker, not a bully, not greedy for money. Virtues. Hospitable, loving what is good, sensible, righteous, holy, self-controlled, holding to the faithful message as taught. I think Paul is realistic in his expectations of the Cretan church and its leaders because it was a young church that existed in a culture, remember, that Paul describes in just a few verses later as it's a culture full of liars, evil beasts, and lazy gluttons. Okay? It's a hard place to be a Christian. At a minimum, Paul wants the elders to live up to the basic standards of the Christian life. It looks heavy to us, but it's actually basic and very consistent with how a Christian should live. Feels heavy because we've got so many stories of leadership that fail. But Paul would say, guys, I don't know why you're surprised by this list. This is how Jesus rolled. And your leaders follow Jesus and then you follow your leaders. And then you follow them as they follow Jesus. I don't, it's not higher grade. It's standard grade for the Christian life. And Paul's emphasis is on the fact that it should be observable. There should be moral behavior in your leaders that show that they hold to distinctly Christian values of holiness and adherence to the gospel. Let me put myself in the spotlight right here. If you don't see these things in my life, I am not worthy of leading this church. Period. If I'm stuck in the vices mentioned up top, I cannot preach to you. That's what Paul says. So it goes without saying that the leaders in the Cretan church uh, should be living according to these values. And they shouldn't be stuck in vices. Because if people like this lead the church, they won't lead the church down the right path. The prohibitions in this list against alcohol and monetary greediness are found in all three lists of qualifications for elders, right? So we get them in Titus 1, we get them in 1 Timothy 3, and we get them in 1 Peter chapter 5. So the reason why monetary greediness gets mentioned in all three lists is because that constituted a substantial part of the problem in Ephesus and Crete. The leaders drank too much, and they loved money too much, which caused a lot of problems in the church. That's why every single list that talks about leaders says this. They should not be excessive drinkers and they should not be greedy. Because if you put those two together, you've got a problem. So the leaders' households suffered. Let me put this to you straight. If you drink too much and you chase off the money, there'll be nothing left for your household. And it will cause you problems because it will consume you. Therefore, you cannot lead because your household will fall apart. And if your household falls apart, how on earth will you lead other people? The argument's quite plain. Let me show you with another John Chrysostom. Look at this. He says, but, and this is important, if occupied in the pursuit of wealth, he has made his children a secondary concern and not bestowed much care on them, even so he is unworthy. For if when nature prompted, he was so void of affection or so senseless that he thought more of his wealth than of his children, how should he be raised to the Episcopal throne and so great rule? Ew, I don't know about you guys, but if I sat down with John Chrysostom, I'll be very convicted because he says it plainly. The seventh virtue you see in this list is devotion to and competency in the gospel message. So an elder in the church should be devoted to the gospel and they should have a competency with the gospel message. To do what? Well, to teach the truth and also to refute error. The word refute means proving it wrong. You can't lead the church if you can't teach the truth of the gospel and you also can't prove people wrong if they have the gospel message wrong. 
And if this is a virtue that a leader should hold to, then that leads directly into the next paragraph, detailing what is being taught in Crete by the opponents. So let's we'll get to that next week. But here's a really important announcement, guys. If elders are not devoted to Scripture, then they are not fit for service. And let me tell you, as one of your elders at church, there are certain things that I do not do so that I have enough time to read the Bible. Because I have to read the Bible every single day. Not a verse, more than that. I have to chow myself full with the Bible daily. Even though I preached this morning, I got up early and I read Bible, a whole different portion of Scripture with a whole different topic, because that also has to feed me. And as one of your elders, there are certain things that I do not do. So as an example, I don't watch television. I know I mention series a lot, and I pretend as if I do, but I don't, because it wastes my time. Because if I watch telly, I'm not going to read the Bible. It's just how it is. So if we are not in the Word, we're not fit for service. I can't even give you an illustration to explain this, because it's so clear. This is who qualifies to be elders. We will be transforming culture if we have people lead who honor life and relationships above success and human metrics. Right? We've got a lot of human metrics for success. Stuff like vision and wealth and influence. We have to transform culture by stating that there are other things that are more important than that. And that is the life that God has given to us and the relationships that He's given to us. And that a leader that is really worthy of following is someone who takes care of these things. It's not the person who makes the most money, who has the next big business idea, who makes the front pages of awesome magazines, who venerate people for worldly success. We have to be different. I liked what Josie said in question of the day, saying that even though it was in the workspace, that uh, a, a supervisor or manager of her, or boss of hers, was a man of God, firstly. And then you mentioned all his work competencies. But it was man of God first. And that's the way that we can transform culture. The way that we will wisely participate in culture is honoring people who are like this portion of Scripture. Well, yeah, well, like that one. Like this. <laughs> honoring people who are like this and who lead in this way. We live in a country and in a world where people often choose their own leaders. Very soon we'll be choosing leaders for our country again. Let's transform the place by choosing leaders that are worthy of following according to this criteria. Not according to leaders who look slick and who make slick promises. That's just an example. Third point. Who and what are elders overseeing? I want to show you this. Can you see this highlight? Paul interrupts himself to say who the church is before he continues with saying how people should lead the church. He interrupts his list and specifies why it's important that elders are above reproach. Because they are not watching over a human institution. They are stewards of God's household. Lesego and I are not two directors of a company. We are two elders stewarding this really small family of God's household household. And what we should do is not make the church the coolest place to be. What we should do is be concerned for your spiritual health. And we should be rebuking those who are in the wrong. Think of your kids again. If you have them, if you don't, think of other people's kids. It's teaching and stopping. I spoke at uh, my child's graduation on Thursday night, and I spoke in Afrikaans, and I said to them, Look, kids, it's a really easy rhyme. Here's what your parents are supposed to do to you. Leer in keer. Okay, it rhymes quite well. And just means learning and stopping or correcting. That's what we should do. That's what Lesego and I should do. But we should do it knowing and believing that you are part of God's household. You are not our stakeholders or our shareholders or people who have opinion about what we do here. You are God's children first. Think about this. Who are the elders overseeing? 
Elders are, are overseeing people created in the image of God, meant to be in a relationship with Him and with others. That's who elders are overseeing. What are elders overseeing? Elders are overseeing a family of diverse image bearers. You! Sharing the same Father who loves them dearly, loving one another like the Father loved us, and being on the same mission to go and make disciples of all nations. That's what the church is. And that's what elders are overseeing. If you're a believer today, listening to this message, I want you to know that this is who you are, and this is what you are part of. God's beloved child, who He designed, who He sent His Son to die for, so that He can be in a relationship with you. And by His grace, He gave you a whole new family, committed to loving you in the same way that God loves them. This is who I believe you are. And this is what I believe about us as a church. It was God's will to create a family for Himself. It was God's will to be a father of a huge family. You and I were created to be in a relationship with Him. And God never relented. He never gave up. Even though His relationships with humans were strained through the course of the whole Old Testament and are still strained, even though we live in the time of the New Testament, God never relented and He set things right and He made a way for us to be in a relationship with Him and that is through His Son, Jesus Christ. Jesus died so that all of this could come into being. We're not here by accident. We're here because God chose to send His Son and to bring people into His family. And not only that, this gracious Father who has this huge family sent His Holy Spirit to stay inside of us and to help us to live in this reality. That's great news, guys. And if you're a Christian, that is the truth for you today. If you're not a Christian, but you are here, and you did listen to me, I want to thank you, firstly. And secondly, I want to state that this is what you are invited into. Can I just have the together photo quickly, please? This is what you are invited into. Not into making really cool graffiti. You are invited into being with God and with His people. It's a diversity of people, and there's a lot of beauty to it, but this is your invitation. No more struggle on your own. You don't have to. People choose to, but there's an answer to that. You don't have to struggle on your own. You're invited into something far greater than you. No more isolation. No more loneliness. The gospel, the church, and the family of God is the answer to our current societal problems of being lonely and struggling alone and being isolated. Think about this, guys. We live in a city that has got 2.8 million people in it, but then people still say that they are alone. I live in a townhouse complex where I can walk to the front doors of all my neighbors and knock on their doors, and still there's people who would live there and say, I'm very alone. We see hundreds, maybe thousands of people in a day that we walk past, but we still feel alone and isolated. The gospel, the church, God's family, that's the answer. And if you're not a Christian today, the last thing that I want to say is, there's no more chasing after worldly things. Because worldly things will not satisfy you. But you're looking for your satisfaction in worldly things, and you're still not satisfied. And that's why you need to hear the good news, is that there's something else that God has done to save you from this really, really, really bad space that you're in. One last remark. I think we'll be transforming culture. If you think about uh, our third point of who the church is and what the church is, by treating people as image bearers of God. 
Period. If you treat someone like they were created in God's image, you will transform culture. Every single person. It doesn't matter what you feel about them in that moment. If you treat them as an image bearer, we will change this community. We will change this community if we talk about the other as family and testifying about how that enriches your life. In front of me now sits a diversity of people. That is great news because the church is supposed to be diverse. You will be in a space in this coming week where someone will say something about someone else and it will not resonate with you. It will pierce your heart. And then you have to speak up and say, dude, listen, whoa, we cannot talk about other people in that way. We can't. And let me tell you why. Because those others that you just put a label on, I serve Jesus with them. I sit in the same church as them. I call them brother and sister, dude. You can't make a statement like that. I'm just duding now because I'm a dude, right? And I'll probably be speaking like this to a dude. But you don't have to call a lady a dude. You guys see what I mean here? Yeah? This is the way that we'll transform culture. It's divide versus unite. Which one do we want to do? Because the world is steering towards greater and greater division. We should be steering towards greater and greater unity. I wanted to make this rhyme, but I couldn't, but I still tried. Flee versus greet. The privilege of the Christian. Eta, my name's Reina. But your name's not Reina. Like, just insert your own name. That's our privilege. It's to greet people. To be nice to them. Exclusive versus inclusive. The world is steering towards exclusivity. You have to do something to be in. In the church, you don't have to do anything to be in. You can just come. Because Jesus made a way for everyone. By God's grace, we are invited into this profound identity and experience. And we are given guidance about how these things should work. And it asks for a response of us as a church. Question, will we follow these truths?